Hello YouTubers, you are at Real Turkey Channel and with your loving caring presenter Atilla Yeşilada. In the second video of the year for Real Turkey Channel, I'm going to cover the subject of how Erdogan's foreign pals are bankrolling his election campaign and whether their aid is going to be sufficient for him to win the dual elections, presidential and parliamentary, now officially scheduled for May 14. Uh, the answers are, for those who don't have sufficient time, Qatar, Azerbaijan, Saudi Arabia and Russia have provided differing amounts of, but rather substantial, in-kind or financial support to Erdogan regime. Each have their own motivations. These have averted a currency crisis and perhaps somehow relieved the pain the people on the street feel from inflation and higher energy prices but they have not been enough to make a sufficient difference in the polls for Erdogan to win the election based on current poll data and what I anticipate the opposition to do very soon. Erdogan is still doomed to lose the presidential elections and the parliament will fall to the control of the opposition, which consists of a six-party bloc, more or less mainstream, and the left-wing plus pro-Kurdish rights party HDP. How are these gentlemen, they're all gentlemen by the way, no ladies there or women, helping Erdogan in different ways? For instance, Qatar does currency swaps, which are essentially window dressing. They don't do much in effect, but they help increase central banks' FX reserves on paper. Also, Qatar is reportedly uh, buying the euro bonds issued by the Turkish Treasury, thereby helping uh, contribute to a better issue to lower interest rates on those euro bonds and probably even attracting more investors who, in the absence of Qatar, would have not participated in such auctions. Saudi Arabia has promised a $5 billion cash deposit twice. Uh, into the accounts of the central bank, presumably free to be used by the central bank as it sees fit, but to the best of my information, that money has not arrived. You may question my credential as an expert when I say to the best of my information, but believe me, current Turkish reporting all the way from inflation to central bank reserves to budget data are so opaque, we honestly don't know. It might have arrived. Azerbaijan helps with small deposits, a couple of billion dollars. My personal suspicion, some of the money that's coming from unidentified sources, which helps balance the current account deficit, is Azerbaijani help. Russia has helped Erdogan in a multitude of ways. First, uh, it's uh, the subsidiary of Gazprom, which builds nuclear power plants, has deposited seven to ten billion dollars into Turkish banks uh, to finish the construction of Akkuyu nuclear power plant, which it's building. Uh, reportedly, once again, we don't know, honestly. Reportedly, Gazprom, uh, which is the main supplier of Turkey's uh, uh, natural gas monopoly, Botaş, has deferred Payments, that is, Botaş is importing natural gas from Russia, uh, but not making payments. There is an understanding, if not a formal agreement, that these will be paid sometime in the future. Sums we don't know. Uh, the market rumor is that there is a $20 billion facility established by the Gazprom on which Botaş can draw. But actually, how much of it used, we don't know. I, I don't think it's more than six, seven billion dollars. All in all, again, difficult to make a sum, but uh, these have substantially helped a central bank to build its reserves. It allowed the Turkish government to stabilize natural gas and electricity prices, not reflecting cost increases to these prices, thus somehow alleviating the pain of the industry and, and the consumers. And most importantly, either by the perception that they created among investors that, you know, Turkish Central Bank is 
unofficially backed by these countries or through their direct financial contributions to reserve to reserves have averted a crisis. Why are they doing this? The motivations of Qatar and Azerbaijan are fairly easy to understand. Uh, these are strategic military allies of Turkey. Essentially, Qatar relies on the Turkish army, both in terms of personnel, training, and equipment and material on the Turkish military forces. It also has substantial direct investments in Turkey, but I don't think that's the matter. I think Qatar uh, ha and Turkey have established this trust that if Qatar is ever in trouble, militarily speaking, Turkey will come to aid. Azerbaijan clearly, uh, the, the, the you know, same thing, but slight different motivations. For those of you who are not familiar with uh, regional uh, demographics, uh, Azerbaijanis are also Turks. We are also Turks, or we call ourselves Turks. Uh, the languages are very familiar, and Azerbaijan has this ages old conflict with Armenia in the latest round of which Azerbaijan emerged victorious, largely not, well, Israel also helped, but largely thanks to uh, Turkish army's military advice, again, you know, ammunition and most importantly, drones, uh, the armed uh, military drones that uh, Turkey sent to Azerbaijan. And so obviously there is mutual dependency and sort of, I think, at least the view in Turkey is that Azerbaijan sees Turkey as a big, as a loving big, bro big brother. The most surprising is Saudi Arabia because Mohammed bin Salman and Erdogan have been blood enemies. Uh, he, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, had ordered the assassination of a dissident journalist, Khashoggi, in Turkey, in the Saudi Arabian consulate building in Istanbul. And Erdogan has declared him an enemy and has started an international campaign to pin the, you know, the blame on Mohammed bin Salman. At the end, uh, Erdogan retracted all the charges, ordered the judges and the prosecutors to close the murder trial here. Did so the Saudi Arabian promise of military uh, of monetary aid could be uh, in return for that. It could also be again. I don't quite agree with that viewpoint, but Saudi Arabia and Russia may prefer a leader like Erdogan, who is not a democratic leader who doesn't listen to anyone and loves to cut person-on-person -person deals. Certainly from that perspective, it would be better for Mohammed bin Salman to deal with an, you know, democratically elected leader who is, you know, obviously uh, answerable to the parliament and to his or her coalition partners. Nevertheless, I didn't think that uh, even Qatar would help Turkey simply because as everyone who knows Arabs would agree with me, they hate non-Arabs interfering in their political affairs. And Erdogan has committed that cardinal sin time after time. So I would have thought, again, I was wrong, that they would not so openly uh, support Erdogan or they would be uh, much less generous in supporting Erdogan. <laughs> Putin is not surprising. Uh, Erdogan and Putin have established this frenemy or friends with mutual benefits relationship. There are certain policy areas like Syria, Azerbaijan, Armenia, they don't necessarily agree, but they have sort of established enough personal trust not to let these smaller matters to uh, muddy the bigger picture of both sides providing benefits to each other. What are those benefits? Well, obviously for Erdogan, it's obvious. Uh, he has an audience with Putin. Uh, probably Putin is also helping Erdogan win elections as he did in, well, as he tried to do in the United States in several European elections. Uh, but most importantly, I think Putin and Erdogan see themselves when they look at each other. Uh, so it's much easier for them to communicate. And of course, for Putin, I have a suspicion, I can't prove that uh, some of the banned uh, articles uh, are flowing from Turkey to, Rus to Russia. So, you know, either Russian entities resident in Turkey or Turkish businesses buy these things, uh, promising to the supplier that they'll be used domestically, they're transshipped to Russia. I can't prove that. But I think 
two important areas where Erdogan is helping Putin is politically. A, Putin wants the Syri Syrian war to be over because he's overextended in Ukraine and the sooner Assad can declare victory so he can reduce his financial support and bring his very established, very, very experienced uh, fighting units from Syria to Ukraine is a direct advantage. I don't think Assad and Erdogan will reach a peace agreement, but at least um, they love Putin so much, they'll probably have a, a summit uh, where they will agree to disagree. But the optics of the situation is that Putin is helping Assad win the war and helping Erdogan to extricate himself from the Syrian mass, which is popular at home. Finally, of course, the Erdogan's uh, threat of veto, well, not threat at this point, as long as Erdogan is in power, Turkey will, uh, Turkey will not allow Sweden to, to ascend to NATO. The Quran burning incident in Stockholm, again, I am a devotee of free speech. To me, even that despicable act is not in violation of the First Amendment, for the, for the, so it's a form of political protest. But clearly the Muslim world thinks differently across Turkey, whether we're secularist, Islamists, or just uh, mainstream people uh, have great respect for Quran, as well as uh, the New Testament and the Old Testament. And just, you know, something like that being burned cr creates such a negative idea in the, in the perception of the people that Erdogan has now the perfect cover to deny Syria, to deny Sweden. Uh, NATO accession, and obviously that's a great problem for NATO, for the uh, joint effort of Western powers to defeat uh, Russia in Ukraine. So uh, Putin's motivations are very obvious. Have these helped uh, to put Erdogan on a clear path to election victory? No. On top of this, he has initiated an unprecedented pork barreling effort, essentially, you know, sending everyone checks uh, forgiving uh, tax arrears, social security premium, forgiving everything, all, all financial crimes against the state. I can, I'm going to do another video about this historic pork barreling effect. And all of that together increased the votes of AKP and its ally MHP on average four points between June and uh, end of January. But even then, I average polls uh, over the last 15 polls, uh, the share of the national vote going to AKP MHP is still 41.5%. Going to the opposition is of course 58.5%. And given that further financial aid is unlikely uh, and anything Erdogan doles out to the people loses value very quickly because of the high inflation environment in Turkey. Uh, these are not going to be sufficient for him to win elections. Another thing, I think I'm the only one among Turkey experts who think the main opposition alliance called Table of Six is going to be able to field a single candidate backed by a decent orthodox economic problem a uh, program and a coalition protocol, which is essentially, if they come to power, how they are going to rule Turkey. If they do that, uh, I think the polls are going to change very differently. Uh, Erdogan may spend hundreds of billions of Turkish liras and may draw on aid of his foreign pals, but I don't think he has changed the perception among a vast majority of voters that his economic policies are, or, are insane and that uh, his uh, toxic, polarizing rhetoric has become poison for everyone in Turkey, not only for Kurds and the opposition, but even for most of the AKP voters. So I haven't changed my conclusion that uh, Erdogan's pals are not going to be sufficient for him to win the elections. Oh, by the way, one, one final word. Uh, in presidential polls, too, the weakest potential candidate to contest him, Kılıçdaroğlu, the chairman of CHP. Out of the last 15 polls, I think Kılıçdaroğlu beats Erdogan in 11 out of 15. 
The other potential candidates, which in my view will not be nominated, Imamoglu and Mansur Yavaş do better. So again, I think to me there is fairly clear and conclusive empirical evidence that all of these have not significantly increased Erdogan's chances in the coming 14 May elections. Thanks again for watching Real Turkey channel and you know the drill. Subscribe, ring the bell button, I don't know, uh, comment, etc., etc. Have a good day.